Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. And today, we're discussing how news organizations report on climate change, climate change facts, climate change fictions with special guest, Ben Strauss, CEO and Chief Scientist at Climate Central, the science news organization, and Megan Parker, the Executive Director of the Society of Environmental Journalists. So thank you both for joining us. It's just, it's really wonderful to have you. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm going to set you up. We're going to go over to you, Ben. Uh, 2021, wild ride for the climate, right? We were talking three to five years ago about eventually we would uh, reach a tipping point. It's looking increasingly likely like we've actually reached some sort of a tipping point. And we've, we've seen uh, spikes in ocean temperatures, we've seen sea ice uh, um, uh, reductions, we've seen uh, huge, huge uh, natural disasters in the United States, uh, $420 billion plus weather disasters, we've seen tornadoes, fires, and so on and so forth. And we've seen an increase in news coverage. So let's talk about your organization, Climate Central, and, and how you're helping us to first understand what is going on and, and cope with it, because being informed means that we can do stuff, right? Individuals can do stuff, businesses can do stuff, governments can do stuff. Talk about how you report to equip me, my government, my business, right? My colleagues, my friends, my family um, to, to navigate. Um, thanks so much, Mark. First of all, for for having me on, and um, you know, for the for the time on this um, really important topic. And I think through the COVID crisis, right, we have this deepening appreciation of the of the importance of science for our lives, and um, also for the importance of effective science communication. And it's really uh, it, it can be quite challenging uh, with climate as well as with COVID. Um, the main thing we do at Climate Central is really to provide tools for, um, for climate communication in particular, um, but really uh, tools that can be used by journalists and media organizations, but also by NGOs, businesses, and others that um, fundamentally help you to understand and communicate the local impacts of climate change and also local solutions uh, at scale. So, um, you know, that includes a program we have to support, say, um, local TV meteorologists to integrate climate into their broadcasts and social media um, through our Climate Matters program. It includes um, our real-time climate uh, software package, which lets any subscriber get uh, real-time alerts when uh, you know weather and climate impacts in their location, you know cross a certain threshold that, um, in our point of view, kind of presents an opportunity to talk about climate, tell a climate story, uh, how how climate is changing the impacts that we face. Um, connected to that, um, quite important. And you referenced that is our kind of growing work, and we have some um, research in the pipeline on this to attribute the impacts we're experiencing and even the daily weather that we're experiencing to climate So if change. I'm on the outer banks of, of Hatteras and I'm thinking about how do I protect from hurricanes, or if I'm in the Imperial Valley and I'm in California and I'm thinking about uh, protecting the farmlands there from drought, you're going to, be, regardless of whether I'm a meteorologist or if I'm a rancher, or if, if, if I'm um, um, just a, a citizen in an urban environment, you're trying to provide data. You're not actually trying to, to tilt my beliefs. You're trying to uh, provide a basis upon which I can create my own beliefs. Is that, is, is that correct? That's absolutely right, right? Our, our goal is to convey you know, accurate and compelling um, climate information and make it ubiquitous. So we can tell you, you know, was today's, what we, we can quantify, put a number on how much has climate change likely affected your temperature today? You know, with mm -hmm. continuing research, maybe we can bring that to preset. 
But if you've just had a drought declaration uh, or a crop failure, or you're in the middle of a health threatening heat wave, right? We can say, well, how many days out of the trailing week or month or season have um, distinguishable climate fingerprints, right? That's, that's the work we're putting in the pipeline right now. And how does this fit into the trend over the last 50 years, right? Is it, um, is this becoming more common? Like how unusual is, is today's weather or impact in the historic um, context? All of those are the kinds of things we try and deliver with that real local detail so that people can make better decisions on a local basis. And Megan, how does this dovetail with your work in the Society of Environmental Journalists? You know, I didn't even know years ago that there were environmental journalists until fairly recently, like the, the last five or 10 years, that it was actually a sub-discipline uh, within the journalistic field. Talk a little bit about your work and, and also how the, the diversity of media now, um, with um, social media being a factor, uh, various online and mobile um, interactions being a factor, the move increasingly from print to rich media. How does that affect the work of, of, of your folks? Um, the Society of Environmental Journalists was founded in 1990 to do exactly what, what you alluded to, is help you know bring together environmental journalists uh, to help each other out, to create a peer-to-peer -peer support network for to, to both uh, provide the tools for reporting uh, to each other, but also to support each other and the growth of the beat as a career path, a sustainable career path, which certainly has been challenged, uh, I'd say, in the last decade by, you know, the larger changes in the media industry, including social media, to which you referred, but, but more importantly, to the whole changing business model of journalism. Um, we have uh, really strived to help continue our mission, which is to increase and improve environmental journalism throughout these ups and downs of the last 30 years, and particularly in the, in the last two, with COVID having a significant impact on journalists, both in terms of the demands of the beat, but also in terms of the economic impacts on on their news outlets. Um, so they're dealing with, you know, everything from layoffs to, um, to being overworked to uh, just burnout and trauma from covering, you know, these twin existential threats that are facing us of COVID and climate change. And journalism um, is also under attack. You know, it used to be that you would measure a great uh, journalist. There would be two measures. One is, how true is what they were saying? How fact-based is what they're saying? How, how foundational um, was their research in terms of what they were conveying? And the second is, was it readable? Was it entertaining? Was it, was it something that I could consume? Did they make it easy for me to understand? But now there's a third metric. Does that person agree with me? And if they don't, if we're going to attack them. And if they do, we're going to support them. And regardless as to whether they're facts, or not, and entertainment value seems to have basically overshadowed, in certain uh, respects, um, fact-based journalism. How has that affected your people, uh, Megan? Because there is such a politicization of something that shouldn't be politicized, since we all experience the weather, um, and we all experience climate, um, and we all experience uh, clean air or 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 um, or good drinking water. You know, lead in the water. You know, those kinds of issues. How does that affect uh, your your folks? Well, you know, we're not immune to these to these uh, uh, trends that have affected all journalists. I think, however, that environmental journalists and and science journalists more broadly have been. Um, dealing with this issue for a lot longer uh, than, say, some of the other beats, because the efforts to undermine scientific authority uh, go back quite a long way. So one of SEJ's approaches uh, to this is to ensure that all of our activities are designed by journalists for journalists. Journalists know what they need. Uh, they know what their fellow journalists need. Um, it also helps us avoid uh, accusations of undue influence by our advocates. Um, we do work with all stakeholders and a huge, a very, very wide range of partners, but we have strict editorial independence guidelines that help insulate us, at least, you know, from uh, on, a, on a policy basis, 
uh, from interference by by these uh, by funders and advocates and others, which of course are often the the root of those kinds of uh, attempts to to undermine. Um, in the bigger picture, you know, one of the other ways that we, that we see this trend happening is the uh, attempt to suppress access to information, um, either through disinformation. Uh, actively targeting, you know, bad information at people or just the circulation of misinformation, as well as, you know, good old um, government uh, suppression of, uh, you know, or bureaucracy preventing access to important scientific information that the public has a right to know. So uh, another big part of our work is advocating for access to scientific data and information. Uh, we have a very active Freedom of Information Task Force that works with a, with a lot of different journalism groups um, to help and support reporters seeking to get that information about our air, about our water, about our food to the public that needs to know these things. So we're, we're just uh, on the cusp of completing a poll in which we asked, um, uh, you know, daily news covers politics, business, crime, sports, education, and so on and so forth. How much headline coverage should there be on climate change? And um, nobody said, you know, just none or sporadically. Um, the the greatest answer, and of course, is a select audience, that there should be at least a, a, a regular uh, segment every day. It's just as important as anything else, right? If you're going to report on sports every day, report on climate and environmental issues every day. Um, we also had a few people who said one regular segment uh, each week or, or a segment every month. So everybody wants to know because it does affect everybody. But I have a question for you. Um, in terms of, of how you uh, are funded, how this reporting is funded, you know, if you're talking about politics, political parties want to win. The political parties and the political interests will fund that business. Right. Everybody wants to have attention paid to their company, sports. It's an entertainment industry. There's somebody to fund that. There's no profit. Is there? Where, where's your funding come from um, in, in, in climate and environmental reporting? As a matter of fact, you had both alluded to the fact that there might be opposition to reporting on certain, certain things. Um, ben, how, how, do you, how, do, how do your folks uh, get funded? How do your efforts get funded? Uh, where are the interests that that cause people to give of their treasure and their their work life uh, to this particular cause? What's happening here? I think there's a couple of really important trends that have are changing the news industry. I mean, traditionally, the news media industry was a profitable business. You know, right. it was a for-profit business that that generated tons of cash, right? And but then those you eyes had, have all been appropriated by social media, right? Yeah. So, so, so then Facebook that upheaval and, through that whole business model into flux. And what we're seeing is the increase in in new nonprofit supported uh, nonprofit business models supported um, by donations, whether from large foundations or from individual donors or from uh, grassroots readers. Um, so, and uh, there are a lot of these out there. Some have been highly successful, some less so. Uh, we haven't had a really good analysis of what works and what wasn't yet. I've been a strong advocate that somebody somewhere needs to sit down and say, yeah. these business models, these nonprofit business models for journalism are working and these are not. We've tried a number of great things ourselves through our own fund for environmental journalism that supports beat uh, reporter positions, staff positions at newspapers, as well as small story grants for journalists. But, you know, I know Benjamin also being a uh, nonprofit has, uh, has witnessed these trends as well and has uh, different kinds of funding um, perspective. Well, we're, we're, of course, not a, a traditional media organization. We're not a newspaper magazine. And, and from the start, we've been funded uh, principally by foundations and individuals, um, a few government grants here and there. Uh, and now increasingly, um, although it's still a tiny fraction, uh, generating some earned revenue streams um, through uh, kind of research and data products to- So you know, you're taking more of, uh, are you taking more of an AP kind of, kind of model in which you are, or you are creating- information and you have subscribers within this sector, um, and then you're also trying to create data products 
so that you have diversified revenue streams? Yeah, it's a little closer to that. I mean, AP creates whole stories and we really create story pieces and visuals and tools that others can. So data visualization, for example. Yeah, uh, we're, we're a visual species, right? We've got sea level maps and visuals. We've got TV ready graphics and a whole range of topics from you know climate impact to weather trends to uh, renewable energy uh, and its increase. But it's a challenging time in the media. I really, uh, I mean, even when we were getting started uh, 14 years ago, right? Climate and environment are fairly technical topics uh, inside journalism. It would be special to have a specialist at a, a smaller local or regional outlet. I mean, these back in the day, even the large outlets weren't doing that well in terms of their staffing uh, on, on climate. Now you see outlets like um, the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, the AP is uh, standing up a climate unit. Th- th- these kind of leading newsrooms are staffing up and have the resources, but now um, smaller or- news organizations and, and local ones, which are, by the way, the most trusted ones when you, when you poll um, the public, um, right, they're struggling to hold on to a science specialist, let alone an environment or a climate specialist. And um, so, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we can play a little bit of, of a role in um, providing support for those outlets to still tell climate stories because we can provide um, co- scientific authority and confidence, right? What we give them uh, is scientifically backed. Mainly we provide tools. We also um, have a partnership journalism program where we essentially team up with the, uh, a reporter uh, or editor at a local outlet and co byline a piece in which they do the local reporting in color and we provide kind of the scientific backbone and context or maybe provide some data from um, either our own analysis or a- analysis coming from the broader scientific community as, we, as we've got an interesting hybrid with both practicing scientists and journalists on, on staff. But One of the it things is, that I find really interesting, yeah. Ben, is that as I travel around and I, uh, and I uh, talk with people uh, around the country, everybody's interested now. It used yes. to be when I would go around and I would talk, I, I would I would um, get a lot of people who were saying, you know, I'm not really too sure about this. People are being really alarmist. In the early days, um, it, you know, the Inconvenient Truth days with uh, Al Gore's slideshow and so on and so forth, there was a there was huge skepticism. Uh, but I think everybody's just detected, you know, whether it's uh, it's uh, it's hurricanes in Louisiana and 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 flooding. Or, uh, or the fact that um, you know, year after year after year, we have uh, droughts throughout the country. If you're a farmer, you care. Yeah. If you're living, you know, in, in, in a heat wave urban center uh, with few trees, you care. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter. It, well, you know, it, I mean, this summer we had what felt like a record season for extreme uh, heat and and other. Um, Kind of weather climate impact. Fires in Colorado, my Fire. God, you know? In December, right? And and um, actually, there was also a record jump in public opinion from the spring to the fall. So, it, I mean, this is a little bit our, our theory. Uh, climate is originally a kind of devilishly hard um, topic to communicate around, but um, the more people see it in their neighborhood and in the present, right, the more urgent and tangible it becomes for them. And unfortunately, that's what's happening as people are experiencing the impacts. And importantly, as the media is increasingly slapping that climate change sticker and label on these events that we're experiencing. And that is a real shift. It was really different this summer than it would have been, say, five years ago. Um, so I think the media is improving in that way. Um, we're really seeing people understand it more. I think, you know, the movie Don't Look Up is a great metaphor. At first, you just have these couple of scientists who can see the comet through their telescope, but no one can see it with their bare eyes on Earth, right? But then as time passes, like you can see it a little bit with your bare eyes and it gets bigger and bigger, right? And that's when people start to really wake up to it, unfortunately, too late uh, in in the case of the movie. We just finished another another poll, Ben, and we asked what the primary source for information on climate change. It's all over the place, right? Mm-hmm. One person says broadcast national uh, or broadcast news. Another says uh, you know major journals, local journals, webcasts, 
uh, nonprofit media and so on. It really is all over the place. It's very rare that we have such a dispersal of, of information. And that's that poses a challenge as well because you can't just end up creating uh, certain uh, conduits for information. There's also a challenge in terms of us, us citizens, non-scientists, non-journalists, understanding the scientific method. How do you connect the dots between, and that was the whole thing with, with UP, you know, they, they were talking science and people were talking instead communication strategies and branding and and all these, these things that had nothing to do with, with facts. How do we educate, Megan, people, me, you know, just a normal person who goes about work every day, how do we educate people to really understand a world that I'm not part of. I am not a scientist. Um, I don't necessarily know the scientific method. How do, we, how do we get there? Well, I think from the journalist perspective, because um, this is a big problem, right? We have people right. who have a, if you look at what's happening with COVID, you have people who have something that's touching them right in front of them, and yet they still are not concerned or and and messaging or not facts, right? <laughs> in it the right way. So it's clear that while, you know, journalism is a, a, a methodology based on facts and observation and the concept that if you present information to people, they will absorb it and, and make the right decisions. It's clear that we need to kind of step back and think about what other factors are impeding, you know, that theory of change from, from reaching certain segments. I would say that overall, we see as, as the polling numbers that Ben mentioned, and we see this in both climate change and COVID, that yes, people are absorbing more information and they are seeing what's happening and they are realizing what's happening. But that is not necessarily sufficient to lead to political change, as we've seen, there are other forces at work, obviously, out there that um, that can counteract, you know, this this uh, this absorption of information leading, you know, to action. Um, in terms of, and partly, what they exploit is exactly what you're saying: that the people's lack of fundamental shared understanding of complex scientific topics. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's rooted both in sort of how we um, understand risk uh, and, and uh, it's not just the scientific method, it's also about risk, right? So part of it is just how science is produced, but also part of it is in large part, what we absorb, understand is a, is a reasonable risk or an unreasonable risk. I think that's a missing element of education in our society that really affects this. I'm sorry for speaking over you, but you, you just incited this thought. Do you all need, as journalists and as fact-based individuals, do you all need to become better at the edutainment piece that is driving social media today of making it more fun, more interesting, more digestible to absorb your information? Because it seems to me that that part of the uh, of the uh, genius of the successful disinformation and purveyors of of non fact, emotionally based um, uh, media is it's entertainment value. It's 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 just fun. And well, I'm not sure. Believe- I'm not sure if fun is the word. I think there's they're tapping into some deeper emotions of anger and exclusion that people respond to, those are very power, but it is emotional. I will agree, agree with that. Um, and I think that there is, um, you know, journalism has uh, it long been about the people story, right? Who's the, there's a common question. Who's the, who are the people? Where are the people? Uh, I remember one journalist, very highly successful series. He said when he first pitched it to his editor uh, and it was about fishing said, editor said, I don't want to do, stories about fish. Don't tell me about fish. And he said, no, 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 no. It's about the people who do the fishing. And then she was like, okay. And this went on to win, you know, multiple awards and change the world and everything. Yeah. I, I think um, probably, right. We're talking, oh, sorry. <laughs> Just it's, it's a question of making the content, you know, interesting and compelling, right? Edutainment is one flavor of that, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of strategies. It is challenging though. We are not wired 
to have the same level of interest in, you know, long-term shifts in the weather uh, that we are around, you know, well, what's my neighbor doing? What, what's this tribe doing? What, right? Um, so that is, again, kind of grounding it in people. The more we can ground it in people uh, and where local contexts, what matters to me, I think, uh, the more we can make it visual because we're a very visual species. 30% of the brain is for vision. 10% is for, you know, language and logic, roughly speaking, by volume. Um, so there are a lot of strategies to employ, but it, it's a hard problem at the same time. Um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to uh, respectfully assert that we all have an issue here. In in I, I believe that it's not the negative side. I think it's the actual fun and release side. I think even getting angry is can, can be fun, right? You can finally get angry. You don't have to have all these social strictures of being polite, right? You can just let it all go. And and I just I just feel that that uh, journalism. Conventional journalism, fact-based journalism, is is provided too often in a boring way, and I think that that there is a whole group of people who use communication in a way that is far more creative, and they're being successful, and we end up with this tilting of American civil society, which is quite damaging. I think we've got to get off of our high horse. I'm trying to do it here. I'm trying to create short, fact-based discussions of really important issues. And we think about this every day. How do we keep it exciting? How do we yeah. engage people? And, and I think that we've just got to do a way better job. I think it's on us because if we're not making it exciting, then people are going to go to wherever the exciting stuff is. And if it's disinformation, they'll go there. You know, how do we, how do we, you know, everybody has something to contribute to this. Right. And I think that, you know, the, uh, if you look at the well-resourced publications, they are trying a number of different ways, right? You look at, you know, the New York Times, right? They've got videos, they've got polls, they've got text-based, you know, interactions. You can shine Moving up. Moving pictures, got, right? But I yeah, guess I'll, got, I'll, I'll also say that, right, but, don't, don't look up. It's the first half good climate movie we've had, period, right? For, <laughs> for the topic, frankly, that, in the history books that are written a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now, the only thing that the future will care about is what we did on climate. They will not give a damn about anything else. And for a topic of that magnitude in the sweep of, hit, of human history, right? There, there's one half good movie uh, and, and, we're, and, and, and we're, when we're struggling we're struggling yeah. in the journalism and communication field. Absolutely. It, it's an area that needs a lot more investment because we're not there. We're yeah. not there at the level of communication that you need for a topic that is, is really going to be the defining topic of the next um, thousands of years, what we do. If you take it down to the local paper level, right? You've got local papers that are operating on staffs of like two or three people. Those people are not going to be making fun videos you know they're they're out, they're trying to cover schools covid crime politics corruption and maybe climate change if they're lucky right like on their lunch break so you know there is a real challenge here in the funding and the resources to do what you're talking about and the disinformation misinformation side where they're getting their money clearly they don't care, you know, how much it costs, you know, if it meets their political aims, right? So there has to be a lot more investment at as biggest scale possible if that is the answer, right? Because those things are expensive. And it's up to us because our lives depend on it. Ben Strauss, CEO and Chief Scientist at Climate Central and Megan Parker, Executive Director, Society of Environmental Journalists, this has been a great discussion, really fascinating. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you for the work of your, of your folks who are uh, fighting the good for the site uh, fight. And, um, and thank you for sharing some of the actions that we can all take to make facts more interesting, more visualized as you are doing, Ben, and, and engaging more people as you are doing, Megan. Uh, thanks so much. Stay safe. And that's the nonprofit report. Um, uh, attendees, thank you so much for uh, your questions, which we found very useful. And uh, we'll see you on Thursday. Have thank a great you. day.